Sally, how are you doing? How's it going with you? You know, um, it's going. Uh, I, I honestly cannot complain, but I still do it every day. But I'm, I'm working on it. But uh, I'm healthy I and mean, I'm reasonably sane. So, uh, you know, I have lots of blessings to count, I guess. Yeah, I feel the same way. I complain. You know, I've like had a lot of travel plans ruined this year and a lot of other plans. But like in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty minor compared to what else is going on. I'm healthy. My family's healthy. Healthy. I'm safe. I'm also staying sane. I'm a huge introvert. So I think being at home for a long time hasn't been as much of a challenge as it's been for some of my friends. But it's kind of starting to wear on me after a couple months. So a couple of friends and I are going to look into getting a cabin, just sort of moving away and just like riding oh, out the storm together. We'll see how nice. that goes. But one thing I've noticed that I've really kind of enjoyed, kind of a silver lining, is it feels like everything's moving a little bit slower. Like the whole world is moving slower. Uh, people just aren't getting as much done. They've got their kids at home. Everyone's cutting everybody a little bit of slack. And for some strange reason, that just makes me feel better. It feels like it's taking a load off my shoulders. I don't have to run as fast. Do you feel the same way? Do you feel like you've slowed down or the world has kind of slowed down and that, that affects how you, you think about your job and how you work? That's a good question. My world definitely has slowed down. My circle has um, focused a lot more. Mm -hmm. And at first, at first, it's funny. At first, I was just complaining because I had all these like I had to move at these travel plans with a big retreat coming up. And like we had to reschedule and cancel and like do a ton of these like changing my life plans, which I wasn't cool with. Right. I was like, you know, uh, reality was was sending us all some cards and I was just like complaining about the, the cards I was dealt. Um, and then I, at some point I was like, wait a second. You know, I've been complaining about too much travel for the past three years, every <laughs> single week. And now that there's no travel, I complain about not traveling. Like, right. I'm like, I'm just an asshole. Like, this is just the reality. It's just like, no matter what happens, I just complain. <laughs> and um, and so I, I started to work on my, my attitude and then being able to, I think, slowly adjust to the pace, mm. create a routine and appreciate um, kind of what this phase in time of my life, what it presents to me and what I can learn from it. And it's been, you know, it, it made a big change. But in the beginning, I have to say, in the beginning, I was like fighting reality and you always lose when yeah. you do that. And so I was just str struggling with it hard. Um, the pace thing is interesting. Um, yeah, the, the pace has slowed. But I, it, I think it's more like, I, I just spend a lot more time, like my mom, for instance, right? I, I, I have a very close relationship with my mother, but typically I would see my, I would see my mom maybe, you know, once every two months and I would maybe talk to her once every other week for like a longer mm -hmm. conversation. And, uh, I've been talking to my mom every single day. I visit her twice a week. I'll drive to her place and she come out of the balcony. I will be down and. We'll just chat for an hour. And that's kind of awesome. Like, it's sad that now I can't, like, I wasn't hugging her. And, like, it's, it's sad that it's under these circumstances. But I'm still glad for it because there's just, uh, I'm just spending a lot more time with my family, a lot more time with a small circle of friends than I used to when life was so busy and I was always on the go. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely been a blessing. Yeah, I kind of have the same story with my mom. We don't have any balcony chats because she lives across the country. But she's got a Zoom account now, and she'll just hop on Zoom with me and my brother and just chat with us, uh, talk to us about indie hackers and what we're up to. And it's cool how it's brought us closer together. It's kind of helped us recognize like just the the importance of life and the things that really matter. And I almost wish that you know six weeks a year we would just kind of do this like social distancing thing, slow everything down, bring everyone together, cut everybody some slack, and just relax for a little bit. Uh, but it's unfortunate that had to happen under these circumstances. Yeah, so, so true. Yeah. The last time you were on the podcast, we talked all about sales. And it's a great episode. I was telling you earlier, I constantly uh, recommend that any hackers go listen to it because sales is one of these things that almost every fledgling founder struggles with, people are afraid of. And you gave like a masterclass on how to think about sales, how to find your first 100 customers, no matter what you're doing, how to send great emails. But we didn't talk about your company, Close. The last time we talked about clothes was two years ago when you were on the podcast. And two years is a very long time uh, to, to run a company. So tell us about how, how things are going with clothes and remind us also what clothes is again and, and how it works. 
Yeah. Um, so Close is a, a sales tool, basically a CRM that helps small and medium-sized businesses to sell better, to communicate more and better, and uh, to close deals. And um, we're a fully remote team. So we're, I think by now we're like 45 people or so, uh, 14 different countries. And we're profitable, we're growing, and we're kind of like trying to build a house we want to live in, uh, which is uh, simple, but yet challenging. Um, And... Yeah, I don't even know when you were when you even when you just said the last time we talked about clothes was two years ago. I was like, wow, what happened those two years? And this was like I draw a blank because like it's all a blur in my life. It's just all a big. If it's last week, I can tell you, and then everything else is like two weeks ago or three years ago feels the same. I don't really yep. know, <laughs> but uh, but we I think uh, for us really over the last two years maybe one thing that we have been going through is like this kind of awkward some people call it like the messy middle i call it like the awkward teenage years of a company's life cycle where we're not really children anymore like we're not really a startup startup anymore but we kind of want to have all the privileges of no responsibility and no process and just being cool and just like winging it but we're also not real adults yet Right. So we can have like we don't we don't have all the privilege of a real massively scaled organization. So we're in this middle phase where we have to find our balance of being more adult, like and stepping up our game and leveling up our game appropriately to mm. where we are as a business. And it's just awkward. It's a, you're always like one <laughs> the awkward off. teenage years <laughs> is super <laughs> awkward. Uh, anytime you try to like change something about the, you know, uh, like saying, OK, now we're at a size we need to like. Um, move differently or change some of the things, the way we do them, the way we work, it always feels like awkward and like so corporate. It's like, Mm. why do we need this? Like there's an inner rebellion of the child that's like, I don't want this responsibility and all these things. Yeah, I don't want to grow up. (laughs) I don't want to have a job and earn money, right? Can I just be be like a child, a play, but I want to, you know, have the power of an adult of deciding where I want to live and make all my own decisions and all that. So um, that's kind of like the last two years and still ongoing, I would say, uh, we're in this like super awkward trying to figure out adulthood and, and, and uh, that's been, that's been a fun and awkward ride for sure. So how do you look at that when you're deciding, okay, well, I've got this one list over here of all the advantages of being like a small scrappy startup. And another list of all the advantages of being like kind of a grown up company and having all this responsibility and all this success. What is appealing in that second list that's that's causing you to basically drive to be a grown up company? Why not just stay tiny, stay free and keep all those advantages? You know, being a 40 year old that acts like a 12 year old, it just isn't cool. Like it's not really, <laughs> it sounds like a cool idea. Like, hey, what if you just, I don't know. You know, played video games all day long, collected an yeah. unemployment check, and ate Mars bars. Like, they, I get there's part there's there there are days where I'm like, that would be awesome. Like, just not doing anything would be fun. But in reality, it's just not fun uh, to live a life like that. At least not for us. I think part of what drives us at close is this feeling or this dedication to. Um, growth like internal mm-hmm. growth personal growth and growth as an organization as a team as a company and anytime we're growing i feel like there's a sense of fulfillment within the business people are happy yeah. people feel like things are changing in a positive direction there um and, and the you know, learning and growing through that process with the business and anytime we're stale there's like the sense of uh, restlessness and unfulfillment and it's like everything is the way it used to be uh, but it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like we're learning fast enough. It doesn't feel like we're we're growing. So there, so I do think that um, as the business is growing, as the amount of team members we have, as the amount of customers we serve, as the amount of revenue we generate, it's just naive and childish to be like, but I want this to keep going on indefinitely up and to the right while I still act like it's four <laughs> people in a basement, right? Right. Uh, I, I get the appeal and I am, uh, I used to be and still probably am one of the chief offenders of holding on to the old days for longer than I should mm. be, right? And now I've kind of, I've recognized that in me and anytime I impulsively shut something down, 
Like when somebody is like, hey, maybe we could change the way we do meetings. So we need a little bit more documentation here. Like it would be better if we help. My instinct is always to be like, no, we don't need more process. We don't need all this bullshit. And now what I've learned is to just take a breather, just breathe in and breathe out. And just be like, let's put the emotions to the side. Right? If I have this, that strong of an impulsive reaction, it's probably not the smart side of me, the rational side of me, or the adult side of me that is the, the mature side of me that is responding to this. It's probably the child, right? the childish side of me. So maybe I just like marinate on this idea a little bit. Maybe I just look at it. Maybe I'll just ask a few smart people and then I'll add my two cents if this is good or not good. And, uh, and it's challenging. It sucks at times to have to do this. But I, I've recognized that I, I um, was slowing down the growing up process more mm-hmm. than I'd like to admit. And um, I'm trying to get better at it. It's a never ending process. But uh, I do think it's important. Like it's important for us to be the best company we can be and for people here to be happy and fulfilled. And for me, for my own sanity, I don't like to look back three years ago and be like, everything is exactly the same and we're the same people doing the same thing. That sucks. Like that feels like we wasted life. We wasted an opportunity to grow and learn. So um, so that's why I think it's important to like not, not again, not overdo it, right? Which is the, the mistake that we all also do at times. Like we were like, we're three people with an idea and we want to have like hire a CFO, you know, and have a corporate uh, responsibility council and like do all these things that don't match the, the baby size of our life cycle that we're in. Um, but it, it's important to progress and evolve, I think, as you grow as a business. It's interesting to think about the sort of focus on growth and evolving when you have a team and the fact that everyone feels a little bit restless if you're not growing, if you're not going somewhere. It's kind of like, what is the point of this team? What are we doing here? We feel the same way internally at ND Hackers, but also ND Hackers as sort of a community is very different. The community is almost the exact opposite. So I was just on the forum yesterday having a conversation with some people who were complaining about the change. And they're like, well, it's, you know, it's getting too big. Uh, there's all these different things. You know, What about the halcyon days of yesteryear where everything was so small and everyone knew each other? And it's almost like the community is full of people who don't want change. And so it's, it's fun for me trying to grapple with that difference. But in your situation, it's like you don't have a community. You're 100% team. You're 100% people all on the same page working to achieve this goal. So you're all kind of in it together towards growth. You mentioned that you're building the house you want to live in. What do you imagine that house looks like at the end of the day? Like, What companies do you look up to? Who do you model yourself after? And how do you sort of navigate this process of growing up? Yeah, I think that um, for us, building a house we want to live in is like applying really long-term thinking in what we do and trying to build and create things that have longevity. Right? Because that is appealing to us that is to us a a value metric, like looking at something that had real longevity feels more fulfilling, feels like it was something worth doing because it was not just worthwhile for a day and then it was kind of gone, forgotten and useless. Um, And so a, a lot of that can also be translated into just... You know, do, you know, the, 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 it's like the, whatever the golden rule, just, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. So in our case, it's like, how do we build a piece of software that we like using? How do we um, sell to our customers in a way that we would like to be sold to? How do we support them? How do we give support in a way that we'd like to be uh, receiving support versus what's the cheapest way? What's the way every other company in our space is doing it? Um, and I think that also, like for, for us, we realized it recognized, I think, early in this company that we didn't enjoy and didn't like the idea of building a massive organization of people working in this business. Um, so we never wanted to be 10,000 employees, 100,000 employees, whatever. Like we would never wanted to become the biggest business in our category in terms of headcount and people. Because then it wouldn't be the house we would want to live in. It would be like build a house you would like to sell. That would be a house I would really like to sell. It would be awesome probably because you'd get a lot of money if you scale to an insane amount of employees. Um, but it would not be the company I would want to work for, I think, uh, anymore. So um, we had to always grapple with this, the conflict between we like small, like we like small teams, we like a small circle, 
We like as little bullshit as possible in our lives, as much trust. Uh, and at the same time, we're really ambitious. <laughs> we want to have massive impact. We want to accomplish big things. So finding a way to say, what is the right balance between these two mm -hmm. ideas that, that would be fulfilling for us? And we've always said, you know, um, like it, back in the day, we would say like, we'd rather be Craigslist than eBay or WhatsApp than Facebook or, you know, um, just like, can we have a small team, small in relative terms? Could we be 100 people doing 50 million revenue, 100 million revenue, two, 300 people doing a couple hundred million revenue? That seems, um, that would be amazing versus could we do 10 billion in revenue and be 100,000 people, which is obviously probably even harder to do or quite, just as hard. Like it's not harder or better. It's just if I could choose between a 10, 10 billion revenue company with 10,000 employees or a $100 million company with 100 employees, I would choose that, right? Any day of the week. That to me is much more appealing because I could still see myself working in that business, right? Um, so to us, it's like, can we build a company that has significant impact with a relatively small team and um, in ways where, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, I would still actually truly like working in it. That'd be incredible. Um, that's hard to imagine. <laughs> it's very difficult, I think, to accomplish. And so that's why it's appealing. I think a lot about the sort of longevity of indie hackers as well. And also, how do I continue growing this, but also turn it into something where, um, it's just really fun to work on and it's something I could see myself doing indefinitely. And so it's it's very much what you said, building the house that you want to live in, not just the house that you want to sell. I guess in my case, I already sold it, but I'm still living in it. I'm still here. The owners are kind of like, hey, you stay there and take care of the house. And so I'm kind of in your shoes where it's like, yeah, let me make this house as great as I possibly can. And for me, when I think about my ideal life running Indie Hackers, it's getting to talk to interesting people like you on the podcast three or four days a week. It's getting to travel around the world, which you know right now is on hiatus, but going to Indie Hackers meetups across the globe, going to pretty much any country in the world and knowing there's going to be 30, 40, 50 people there who are excited to meet, who want to show me around, who are cool to talk to, and I can learn from them and sort of broadcast their messages to other Indie Hackers so everybody can sort of build their businesses and learn from each other. And then running this online community where it's super cool and I get to code whatever I want and it's like a living, breathing thing and people give me their feedback and complaints and compliments. And that seems to me like super fun and very mission-driven because I know the things that I'm doing aren't just fun for me, but affect other people. And at your company, I think, you know, you're at a much bigger scale in terms of revenue. Indie Hackers make zero dollars. You've got a much bigger team. We've got like four or five people working on Indie Hackers. You've got, I think you said 45. And I think the house you want to live in like has more constraints, more rules, but also you have more power to kind of do whatever you want. For example, I talked to um, Jason Fried and DHH at Basecamp who have like their four day work week and they have all sorts of different side projects they're spending up just to like enjoy working on the things they want to enjoy working on and DHH is driving race cars and I talked to Natalie Nagel at Wildbit and she's also got like a four day work week and her whole vision is her employees having this playground where they can grow and learn and thrive. Uh, do you have anything like that at close? You know, how much are you focused on like the core mission? Do you ever get distracted by these little side things and these like, you know, meta projects working on your business? Um, what's the balance there? Yeah, it's a good question. I think when we started early on, we assumed that we would have a ton of side projects and run our businesses very similar to some of the examples that you shared. And we just never gotten around to it so far. Like we, um, I think, I think that one thing that has always been pretty amazing is that the, the people that we've hired um, have always been incredibly entrepreneurial and we've always encouraged them to, you know, that it, when people came to us and said, hey, I just want you to know, I want to work here for two years and really dedicate myself and grow, but then I want to go on and do my own thing, we'd always go awesome, right? Just keep us in the loop. We want to support you. Maybe we'll be the first customers. Maybe we'll be the first investors. Like, we want to be part of that journey. And um, we had all kinds, like uh, we call it, you know, the, the, the closed mafia, right? And there's all kinds of people that have been kind of part of our journey, for a number of years that um, are now running their own businesses. A lot of them are customers mm. of ours. Um, and, uh, and, and we've had all kinds of cases where even people, we had somebody, uh, Ryan Robinson, uh, who's like a, a quite well known in the kind of blogging space um, and helping people to make money online. He had, his blog was much smaller and his kind of online stuff was much smaller when we got to know him and work on some content stuff. 
And then I told him I wanted him to join us full time. And he said, hey, dude, I, I'd love to. I think the team is really amazing. But I will always work on my blog and podcast and my other projects. And ultimately, I want to do that. And we just talked honestly about it. And I was like, all right, we'll try to help you on your journey there. You'll help us on what we're trying to accomplish on our journey. And we, this doesn't always have to be forever, right? And so for like, I think two years, we Ryan did amazing work for clothes. And we tried to help him as much as possible. And then eventually he was making so much money that we're like, we, one day we'll all have to come and work for you. <laughs> it's just like work yeah. with your, working for your blog. Um, and then we parted ways again, and we're still very good friends and constantly in touch. So um, we've always encouraged side projects. We'll always encourage people to follow their dreams if they're entrepreneurial. And lots of people at Close do have kind of ultimately the goal to do something on their own one day. But in terms of like launching different products um, and having like all these different product brands and all these new spin-up companies within the company, we thought we would do that. And then... So far, we've always been like, well, there's all these things we want to do at close. There's all these projects that we're passionate about. There's all this stuff. And then anytime we discuss, well, this would be a neat idea. Nobody was more passionate about that neat idea than the other stuff we were doing. And so nobody would ever champion and just take a project like that and run with it. Um, and who knows? I don't know. I, I used to think a lot about it. Will one day, will we change? And will this, you know, will we start doing more of these things? And that that idea or that thought faded in the background and it might pop up at some point at a different cycle of the company. Um, but so far, uh, it's, it's not been the case. It's, it's very ironic considering how Close started because yeah. you were running Elastic Sales and Close itself was kind of one of these like distracting internal side projects that yeah. eventually did so well that it kind of blew up and became your primary company. And then you stayed so focused on that and not had that same thing happen again. And it's great. I think most most companies have the opposite problem. They're not that excited about the thing that they're working on. They're constantly chasing cars and they're distracted and it's hard for them to focus. Uh, what is it about clothes that gets everybody so excited in your team? How do you make a product that everyone is super enthusiastic to keep working on? I think, um, I mean, this might sound cliche and I don't want to make it sound like there's not any days that people are frustrated this business or over it or like, you know, like in the last seven years since we've been running close, there have been a dozen of times where my co-founders and I were like, what are we doing with our lives? What is this? Like, is this really the meaning of life? Are we really, are we choosing, making the right choices? So I don't want to sound too much like, oh, we chose such a great thing that every single second of every day is perfect. <laughs> It's just not true. It's just butterflies uh, that, and sunshine and rainbows. Yeah, everywhere. no, that will be that, that's just, that's just not not realistic. At least not for us. So we do have like days where we're like, you know, I wish I'd do something fun that was like new mm -hmm. and had not you know all this baggage that comes with an adultish company, right? Versus a, a and you make any small change and there's like thousands and thousands of customers and users that will complain and will resist the change. It's like, ah, if you, when you start with a clean slate, everything is pretty, everything's beautiful, and you just do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, so, so, so we definitely have those days. But I think, um, I think it, it all starts and ends with a customer. Like, we just serve customers that we care about. Like, similar to what you described, it's like a lot of our customers are – very entrepreneurial startups or at least interesting companies that are moving differently, that are changing differently. I, I often describe it as like we have a lot of – the type of businesses that, that we love to serve is like kind of the, the businesses of the future, right? Smaller companies, uh, a lot of them distributed, a lot of them tech-enabled. Even if they're not a technology company, they're more tech-savvy than a lot of companies in the industry. Very entrepreneurial um, very international. And so when we talk to our customers, we are consistently inspired by what they do, by who they are. And we're like, this is an awesome product that they're building. And these people are really smart and really good people. And this is kind of fun, the stuff, how they figured out to have success so far. And so we get passionate about the type of customer we're serving. And then it's easy to be passionate about building things for them, helping them succeed, right. giving them advice, supporting them. I think one of the best decisions that we made from day one was to say no to the enterprise 
And this is something that most SaaS businesses don't. And from most of them, they, they will never be able to become a 10 billion revenue business without going to the enterprise, maybe or for many, many of them, at least not. But for us, um, from day one, I said, the enterprise is not the type of business I care about. It's not a type of business I'm intimately familiar with. I didn't have a corporate career working at these large organizations to have a real connection to the people that work there, the problem they have, the way they operate, and to be passionate about changing it and helping them. I am like, I don't care about you people. I don't care about your problems. I don't understand it. And I don't want to be in that world. And that also means like saying no to a lot of money once in a while, right? That there's right. always going to be an inter enterprise customer that, that knocks on our door and waves with a huge potential check and is like, wouldn't you know, this amount of money be really great for you people right now. It's going to be really easy for you to get it. Just uh, take one meeting with us. Right? <laughs> and um, and uh, and I'm really happy that we've always said uh, thanks, but no thanks. Not because it's not good, but it, but it wouldn't be the house we want to live in. It's almost and like then, how much money would you accept in order to be bored for the rest of your life? Like how much yeah, would someone have to pay you yeah. to be bored and live an unfulfilled life? Yeah. How much money would somebody have to pay you so you marry somebody that you really don't like and you have to spend <laughs> every day with them at least eight hours a day talking to them? I don't know if there's a check size. There's not enough There's not yeah. enough money for that. Is there enough money to be like for the rest of my life I'm going to be spending eight hours worrying, talking, and interacting with somebody I really don't enjoy? That sucks. And that, that would be the reality if we went into enterprise for me. At that point, I would be like, all right, if this is what's right for our company and this is what's right for everybody else here, then I need to move on and there needs to be somebody yeah. else that's going to be run, doing my job because I would just hate my life. Uh, and then I wouldn't be, I would not be passionate about the things we're doing and the the and sometimes, you know, sometimes we're building features that I know will serve our customers, but I'm not passionate about it. I'm not using this functionality every single day. It's not benefiting me directly. But I care about the people and I care about helping them. And when we then launch it and I see how they respond and how much it helps them accomplish their goals and dreams, then I'm like, this feature is amazing. Like, this is awesome that we built this. Yeah. So I think really caring about the audience you serve um, helps with longevity. It helps with still being passionate five years, seven years into the journey. If it's just, I think it can be fun to just chase money on opportunity and be like, wow, we are like making all this money and we've had this nifty idea in this nifty market. I think that can be incredibly stimulating and fun, but not for 10 years, probably, right? Eventually, you're going to be like, I hate the people I serve and the people I interact and the things we're doing here, no matter how much money it is. So, uh, so I think that that's kind of, that, that's been our hack to still feel passionate about what we do seven years in. Do you think making so much money has changed your perspective on it? Because last time when we talked, you were already doing millions in revenue. I can only imagine that it's more now, and it's it's been years of you making yeah. this much money, having a successful company. Has your perspective changed? I'm sure it had. Like my, you know, I want to say no uh, because I don't like that idea, but I, I do think it has. But I I went through a number of changes uh, of having. A lot of money, a lot of money contextually for me at the time, and then having no money contextually for me at the time. I went through this cycle a couple of times early in my life, and that really helped. That helped significantly. Um, so I feel like this hasn't impacted me as much because I, I had recognized early on already that money is really amazing. It's important. It's great. But it's not, gonna, it's not what drives me, makes me really happy or, or fulfills me. And at some point, the numbers start to become you lose touch with it they're all just meaningless like the 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 they're not exciting i think at the beginning like you know first time i made 10k in my life it was like wow like this is i'm i'm rich <laughs> like i'm this is it like i i can buy everything i want like i was like at a 19 years old i'm like this is incredible i'm so rich um because every because most people that i knew and the family that I, you know, my mom was making like 30K a year, right? So 10K, I'm like, I'm fucking the richest person I know. Um, but then I, I was also broke many times. Um, but I, 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 
at, at some point, and then, you know, when you, ra- I remember raising money, I was like, if I ever raise a million dollars, I don't know why, a million, because that's what we see in movies and the stories we read in books. So I was like, a million dollars is going to be meaningful. It's going to fill me up with fulfillment and make me feel great. Yeah, life will be different after that. Yeah. And then you do it and you realize three weeks later, it's like, you know, what's next? And you go through that cycle off and off, and eventually you stop even believing in it. Like I, I, you know, many years ago, I stopped believing. Once we hit this revenue number, once I hit this number of whatever potential net worth, or I will feel different. I'm like, ah, that all doesn't really matter. It, it really yeah. doesn't anymore. The reason I'm asking all these questions is because most people listening have not built a successful startup that's generating millions. They have no idea what it looks like, kind of at the end of the tunnel. I talked to a lot of people who are just getting started, who are just sort of in the thick of it, and they're not sure how things are going to turn out. So it's kind of cool to see you go through these teenage years and adjust to the money that you're making and figure out what's actually important for you. And I think when I talk to founders in your situation, the answers are pretty remarkably consistent that the people that you deal with are what give you meaning. And so in your case, you get to work with a lot of entrepreneurial people, like the employees at Close are very smart, very talented and ambitious. And quite frankly, those are the most fun people to work with. I love working with entrepreneurs as well. That's kind of how we've set up ND Hackers because you could just talk to them and they know what you're going through and you know what they're going through and just fun to cheer them on and see how talented they are. But also your customers are people that you want to deal with. Like you said, you made the conscious decision not to take more money and sell to the enterprise because that would be super boring for you, but to work with customers who you're inspired by. And I've seen the same thing at ND Hackers. I've seen the same thing that I've talked to other people around. If you're going to start a business, probably one of the most important decisions you can make up front is who do you want to work with and who do you want to work for? And that kind of puts you on track to live a good life as a founder and get through these awkward teenage years and keep going and keep being excited about your product, even if you know you've been doing it for seven years. Uh, let's talk about some of the hard parts. Heaton, mm-hmm. your uh, your co-host on your podcast, tweeted a while ago that the most difficult part of sales and marketing is getting used to the grind. You know, doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, do you think that applies to being a founder? What's difficult for running a company as long as you've run one? Hmm, that's a good question. So I think that most, hmm. so there, there's something, there's, it intuitively feels to me that there's a kernel of truth in, in that statement. I saw that as well. I was curious. I'm ta- I'm rec- we're recording tomorrow, so I'll, I'll try to figure out what, st- what inspired that. Yeah, that what tweet. prompted that? What prompted that? Um, but, uh, and I've also, I've many times talked to salespeople that are like, hey, I've been like first year of sales was exciting, but I've been doing this five years now. And like having these quotas that are like erased every three months and you have to like do another batch of like prospecting, calling, emails, negotiating, closing, and then you hit the goal. And, and then again, it's erased and you have to start from the get go. Like people burn out and they feel kind of that this is a, a tough grind and what's the meaning in all of this. Um and I've always been telling people that like the, the approach, if you're able to find new ways of looking at this and different ways of looking at this, it makes a significant difference. Um, and with salespeople, oftentimes the most surprising thing is because salespeople chase the closed deal so much. In their mind, they're not thinking about the customer as a lifelong relationship. Most salespeople aren't. They're just thinking about it as a deal. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to close this deal and once it's signed, I got my the money on the board. This thing is done for me, right? But the moment you think about these interactions as relationships, I've taught this to many salespeople uh, with, I think, pretty good success. If you think about these people, not just as customers, but customers for the business, but as your customers and as your potential lifelong relationships and partnership, all you can do, no matter how hide the frequencies, how many deals you're dealing with, you can at least pick one customer a week that you're interacting with where you're like, this is a winner. This is somebody that's going to do awesome things in their life. This is somebody I really like. I really enjoy. I think that if I had money to invest in people, I would put money into this person, Inc., right? Um, And then don't just treat that person as a deal or as a decision maker in a deal, but treat them as a new friend, somebody that you want to nurture a relationship with for the rest of your life. Because this person is probably going to go on and be a decision maker in many other companies, do many other interesting things. And you're going to keep going, being a salesperson in other companies, start your own companies. You're going to have a lifelong career. And you're going to be able to benefit 
and get so much bigger of a return and so much more of a fulfilling return because some of these relationships, hopefully many of them will turn into friendships as well, right? Um, if you look at it that way, then it's not just a number that's erased because I hit my quota this month, but I actually have added five more people that I am inspired by that I that I'm hopefully if I nurture that relationship, stay in touch with for the next 30 years. And now selling is building my career, is building my network, is mm. building um, my relationships and not just chasing numbers that I have to yeah. now chase again, again, and again, and again. And I think the same is true in many other situations. I think on the there's there's a certain grind to being a founder. There's certain a, a grind, let's say, I can't even say founder as if it's a generic thing because Thomas, Anthony, me, we're three uh, co-founders in this business. We live very different lives and do very different jobs. Right? So, yeah. um, but I'll speak from a CEO perspective. The, the CEO grind, I think, is probably the you, in many companies, there's a consistency of you dealing with difficult problems or the most difficult problems uh, bubbling up to you, right? Because people don't know how to solve them on their own. And um, at times this can be stimulating and fun. And at times it's a grind and it's, it's painful and it's difficult. And I think there's no one you, you can go to above you to be like, hey, solve this for me. I don't feel like solving it. You know, yeah, it stops and you, with you. And, and I think you turn into the type of person, you probably already are that type of person, but it turns you even more into the type of person that just becomes incapable of ever asking for help to anybody else. And it's just always in the mindset of all problems in the universe flow to me. I solve, 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 solve problems. And when I have problems, I just solve them. Like, I, I, how would I need help? I'm the center of the universe, right? I'm the, yeah. the sun that everything evolves around. And I think that that then turns into really unhealthy and unbalanced human beings that then become terrible CEOs. And, and I've done this, and I'm still in the process of getting better at asking for help myself or even sharing my problems. It's been a five-year process of learning to tell a friend or a family member or my co-founders or anybody, I have a problem. I have something that's a problem in my life right now. This is still difficult to me, but I'm learning to get better at it. But I think that that um, if you purely stay in that mindset of, I'm going to do this like superhero, solve all the problems, having mm. all the answers at all times. If you stay in that mode for too long, then I think it can become very, very burdensome and it can burn you out for sure. I think this concept of uh, of work-life integration, where you realize that these relationships you're developing with people because you're trying to grow your business are actually still real human relationships. and doesn't have to just be business, 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 work, work, work all the time. I think most of us are kind of naturally like that. Like we talk to people, we realize they're humans, but there's something about having this overarching mission where you have to grow this company and it has to work that can kind of turn you into like a single-minded, like single-focused robot at times. You start treating people like they're not people. And when you take a step back, like I've been here, I've been there before too. And you take a step back and you realize every interaction you have with someone can be like a really meaningful, fun interaction. And a lot of the people that you work with probably can and should be lifelong friends because you spend so much time talking to them and they have stuff going on in their lives and you have stuff going on in your lives. And if you just like slow down and have conversations. This is part of why I really like going to Indie Hackers meetups all over the world. Because yeah, I mean, part of it is like I'm I'm doing customer research and I'm trying to figure out why people are using the site and how they're running their companies. But a lot of it is just like, hey, show me around Cape Town. Uh, I want to know what life is like in your shoes. you know. And there's people that I've met all over the world who I still talk to a ton. And I've realized that, again, going back to this idea, the business that you build, the house you want to live in, is not just for your bank account. It's not just for your professional accomplishments. It's also just for your happiness. And if you can use a business to help you build the kind of life that you want to live, for example, if you start a company that helps you meet the kinds of people you want to meet, there's this company Cameo. You can like go on their website. You can find any celebrity, not any celebrity, but a lot of them. And you can pay them like a certain amount of money to send like a cool video to a friend for their birthday or send a video to your mom for Mother's Day or something. And if you start a company like that, like I'm sure the people who run that company get to talk to celebrities all day. And maybe like that's their dream and that's what they want to do. And that's something that extends beyond their business. It's something that is now a part of their personal life. They like are part of these circles that they weren't before. And there's tons of companies where people get to meet people and talk to people and like live and do all these different things that they couldn't do otherwise. So uh, right there with you, I think it's super cool to have kind of this this awareness that you know these relationships aren't just all about 
work. They're not just about the bottom line. I think, I don't know who said that. Maybe, uh, I don't know where I got that quote from, but somebody once said, you know, if you, if you wouldn't want to work with somebody for a day, or if you wouldn't want to work with somebody for the, the rest of your life, don't work with them for a single day, right? It's a beautiful idea. And, and I've always been telling people, and I've been living this, this has been the single biggest impact thing I've done in terms of my happiness and fulfillment is that um, any relationship in my life, I'm thinking of it as a 30-year relationship. Yeah. So if I don't want it to be a 30-year re relationship, I know I don't want to deal with you at all, right? Uh, and I'm not the right person to be in your life. But if I do, I try to think very long-term and there's, there's real power in that and benefit. I know that when you are at the very beginning, all this sounds like like a luxury, like it almost sounds like us discussing which color of Ferraris are the best when you're a founder. <laughs> and it's like, dudes, like I, I, I'm trying to get my first customer. Like, and yeah, it sounds like this is the type of decisions I'm going to make once I can afford making them. This is what I would have thought, but I, I, I don't think it's true. I think that you make these decisions and then you are able to afford <laughs> to, to have that life. Um, but, but, you know, oftentimes, you know how many times people reach out to me and they're like, A, very selfish, which I get as founders, right? They're trying to get start, something started and you have to hustle, right? You have to be a little shameless. That's totally fine. I've definitely been that many times in my life. But there's, there's just a, I have this thing I need from you. Steli, I read a blog post. I listened to you on a podcast. I want your advice. When can we talk for an hour or two hours this week and you give me everything you have, right? And it's like, yeah. right, that's a very selfish proposition that assumes that I have nothing better to do than to give all my time to you. But also, the funny thing is that when I then ask them, hey, could, can we first start an email and you tell me what it is that you need? And then I'll try to help via email and eventually we can graduate to a call. 50% of people just fall off the face of the earth. Like you never hear from them again. Same thing with advisors. You know, people all the time email me. I, we want you on our advisory board. We want to give you shares to be an advisor in our startup. And I always go, go easy, right? Let's not get married. I don't even know you. Why don't you decide to email me once a month, your progress, ask me how I could help. And if over the next couple of months, we both find that I am truly useful and helpful to you and mm. I enjoy helping you, then maybe a year from now, we'll put a ring on it, right? And we'll, you give me some advisor shares and I'll be a, a formal advisor. But let's start one step at a time. And everybody's always like, that's a great idea. And then again, 90% of these people I never hear from again, right? So That's how you know it's going to be a waste of time. If, yes. if they can't even tell you what they're going to talk about on the call, they don't want to talk over email, you've just dodged a bullet. And then there are people that follow my advice on this. I've written about this and where I said, hey, make me part of your journey. Just let me know how things are going over the long term. If I keep hearing from you for 12 months in a row, in month 12, I'm much more invested in your story. I'm, I, I understand you much better. I have much more context and I'm much more willing to help versus yeah. the first time that you ping me where I'm like, I want to be helpful, but I have to ration how much resource and energy I give you. Um, and I think people underestimate that they, they're like, I want everything right now, but they underestimate if I keep in touch with these people that I find useful and helpful and I want to have in my life and I want to learn from, then a year will pass very quickly. Five years will pass very quickly and, and you'll build up and five years from now, maybe you're really good friends with these people. Maybe these people are willing to go to bed for you and really move mountains because they care about you. Um, and all you have to do is stay in touch, right? Keep investing a little bit in the relationship um, and that's not instant success, riches, and wealth, but uh, time passes fast, right? And it's like this Chinese, I'm all, I'm all with uh, motivational quotes today, but it's like this, you know, best time to, to plant a tree is today and second best time, oh, best time was 30 years ago, second best time is today, right? It's like, yeah. start now and you'll see time will pass faster than you think and a year will go by like this. And then these relationships that at the beginning were quite cold will warm up and, and you're going to benefit a lot from that. People get so impatient when they're just starting off as founders. They're like, well, I don't have time to invest in a year in anything, you know, but like that time's going to pass anyway. Like a year is going to go yeah. by no matter what. And so like, would you prefer that year to go by where you invested in these things, just, you know, like a few hours a week, maybe even less than that? Or would you prefer that time to pass and you look back on that year and you didn't do any of that stuff because you were so focused on the short term? And also, do you want five, like two years from now to be the exact same position you are now when you need help from certain people? 
where you just send call. Like, think about this. Think about being six, like 30 years into your entrepreneurial journey and still having to send cold emails to people going, I need your advice. Can you give me an hour? And these people going, I don't even know who you are and I don't have time. Like that, su- that idea should suck to people imagining that. So you don't want to be that person. Well, the only way not to be that person <laughs> is to build relationships yep. um, and inv- invest in those relationships. So let's talk about the modern era. I think it's safe to say we've entered an entirely different era. Uh, yep. Do you remember when COVID-19 sort of first popped onto your radar and you started thinking about how it affected you personally and also affect your business? Yeah, so it started popping up in my radar, I think, in January. But it was more of a, a thing that's happening in China sort of thing. Yeah. And so I was very passively consuming some information. I was more like, ah, oh, interesting. Hmm. I wonder what this is. Then in February, early February, it started kind of becoming more serious. And I remember I was traveling to Thailand. And there was even a discussion, should I go? Shouldn't I go? And I have a, a friend, of, uh, one of my best friends who's lived there for 15 years. Um, and I wanted to visit him and spend some time with him. And he was like, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I feel it's still kind of stable here. I feel it's still safe. You know, do these precautions, wear a mask, wash your hands, you know, keep your distance and it should be fine. And, and, I, and I went there and I was there t- two weeks. And then when I came back, you know, kind of mid-February, then I started to read, like then all of a sudden my Twitter feed started to heat up. And then I started following all these people and all these kind of virologists and experts and everything. And then I started to go into the, probably like many people as well, to the deep hole of like hours and hours of reading and studies yeah. and metrics and forca- de- you know, very dark forecasts. And then I was like, holy shit, what is happening here? And I think towards end of February, I was convinced, okay, no matter what it is, it's going to come to Europe and the U.S. in a really big way. It's going to impact me, my family, my business. So what do I do now? And the first job was trying to convince like my friends and family members to take this more seriously. And that was such a trip. That was the weird, one of the weirdest things about this whole thing. Because they all looked at me like a tinfoil hat conspiracy guy. That's <laughs> same here. That's just weird. And they're all like, why are you so negative? And why are you so scared? And and literally they were making fun of me. And I was like, this is I've never been in this position in my life. This is weird. Why I'm like the the person that screams, like, hey, you need to take this seriously. And everybody's like, this guy is crazy. And it was like an awkward time. Uh, and and it and it definitely like ramped up my anxiety to death con level red. Like I was just like, here are the people that I care about and none of them care about this. And I don't exactly know. I don't even know if I'm right. And I don't know exactly what advice to give them what to do. So it was kind of a weird phase. Um, but eventually I got around to uh, convince my immediate family and then kind of like go through a couple of steps that just felt like preparation Right. I mean, that, that's all it was. And then uh, and then I had to do the uh, went through the same process in the company where I'm like, all right, I need to convince my co-founders to take this more seriously. At that point, I was the one that was like, this is going to be a huge deal. And they were like, no, nah, we don't think so. so. I had to go through that um, and then come up with the game plan. I'm like, this is, uh, you know, this is going to become a huge thing and we need to prepare ahead of it right now and we shouldn't go slow and we shouldn't wait and see like we need yeah. to and and so um so it was kind of I, I think for most people they went in their own little universe through that these cycles um but for me it was like i think early january i started reading and paying attention february i started really think thinking it's going to be a huge thing. And then March was kind of a month later was when every when it started to do the lockdowns and everything else going on. Yeah. And putting my founder hat on, I, I kind of went through the same period, but there was always this uncertainty in the background of, okay, like with indie hackers, how is this going to affect the company? You know, are there going to be more people on the website, fewer people on the website? Um, and, and a lot of ways, I think I was so focused on my personal life, my friends and family that I just kind of put that on the back burner and just said, whatever happens will happen. I'll just react. You know, I don't know how to plan for this. I'm just going to react. And in your situation, I think, you know, you've got a much more substantial company. You have a lot of advantages. You've been remote for many years, for example. It wasn't this awkward transition that you had to make. 
but you're building a CRM tool, you're a SaaS company. I have absolutely no clue. I honestly have no clue like how sheltering in place and lockdown has affected clothes and the CRM space in general. So what are some of the biggest uh, changes that you've had to react to and were you able to predict any of these things? Or are you kind of also you know doing what I'm doing and just like being in reactionary mode and just trying to react very quickly to whatever happens? I think for us, so some of the things that we recognized early was that um, if we're going to go through this like super this global pandemic and if it's going to have this massive economic impact then cash is king and we need to make sure that we can finance things no matter if we have if we experience a big dip in revenue because maybe lots of businesses will churn or lots of businesses will fire salespeople and like for us that means uh, downgrading seats or canceling seats right which brings us down in our overall revenue right so so we decided fairly early a couple of things. One was that we would shift our attention away from contracts. Like our sales team would focus a lot on signing these one, two, three year contracts that would be paid monthly. Mm-hmm. And we thought, well, in an economic downturn, when there's like a massive shakeup, a contract is not really worth that much, right? If these businesses go out of business, the contract is not worth any anything. If they have to break the contract to not go out of business, we're not going to sue them. Like this is... A contract is good during certain stable times, right? But it's worthless during these insane times. So let's not worry about contracts right now. And it shift all our attention to prepays. Let's push to have our customers prepay for a year or two years, give them a great deal because they're buying during uncertain times and see what, what they say. And we didn't know if people would do it or not or if people would get upset with us with even proposing. I, I remember when I early talked to this about this with other founders that are like, People are going to get really upset with you asking them to prepay during these times. That's an unheard of ask. And um, uh, kind of every single month since February has been a record month in prepays for us. And it has significantly impacted our cash position, right? Mm -hmm. And, And hence, it really stabilized the business really quickly. Like, wow, our cash position has gone up. We are in a much better position to weather any kind of big decline or multiple declines of revenue. And I was even surprised how good this worked. And even still to this day, every day, even on the self-service side where smaller customers just log in, create an account and buy, I'm surprised how many choose to prepay right for a year right now. Feel the confidence, feel that the deal is good enough that they want to do that. Um, right. So that that was a very good decision for us that we made fairly early, right? And, and that helped us. Um, and then we went through some of the things that everybody else went through probably is like, how do we cut costs as much as possible? Like we made a, we made a simple math in February, March, where it was like, what if we lose 30% of our revenue, but we want to keep the entire team afloat. We have a small team. There's no fat to cut here. There are no people that we don't like. There's nobody, anybody that we would have to let go now, it would take us another two and a half years to find another person like that and hire them again. This is very costly. So how can we cut costs drastically and save as much as we can without letting anybody go so we can weather the storm together? And then we got very creative and we came up with a lot of aggressive ideas and, and, and we did move mountains in that way also fairly early. Mm-hmm. But we had told the team that we'll do all this together and then we have this like worst case scenario that you will all know we can weather without any more changes. Right. So, you know, like we've done everything up front and now we can like weather the storm. And I think that really helped tremendously make people's anxiety like be relief because people are just so on the edge with their families at home, with Mm -hmm. worrying about their jobs. And what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to be the type of company that's like in March, everything is fine. We're just going to cut some server cost and uh, cancel some subscription. And then in April, it's like, it's not. We have to do these other measures. And then in, in, in May, it's like, well, we have to let go of some people, but most others will stay. So where people constantly feel like in the next couple of weeks, there's going to be more news, more bad news. We didn't want to have that. And and uh, that was a really good decision. And we reacted quite quite fast. Now, we didn't know what the impact would be for us. And the reality is that we did at first see a lot of like teams um, firing salespeople, or downgrading to a lower tier plan, or some of our smaller customers going, I'm out of business. I wanted to build a, a tool to sell to schools. 
forget about it. Or I wanted to build something to sell to bars, a software tool for bars or restaurants, forget about it. Or I'm in the tourism industry, forget about it. So we saw a lot of cancellations on the lower levels, so we lost some revenue early on. Um, but things stabilized, like in terms of our revenue. Mm-hmm. Th- that was mostly kind of our existing customer base, being conservative, saving cost, right? Acting early as well on their end. But in terms of new customer acquisition, nothing changed. We still kept like bringing new revenue, lots and lots of new customers. And that has continued and even improved. Uh, and now kind of it's stabilized where our customer base feels like, okay, we can start adding some seeds. We can maybe upgrade again. We, we're in wait and see. We don't see these kind of big wild swings of downgrades or cancellations anymore. Um, and we've been in a, you know, in a better position than what we predicted and projected. And so that makes, it's always good. That makes always everybody feel like, wow, this, we are in a good situation, much better than what we had anticipated. More bad news can come and this company can weather it. And so that gives yeah. people, I think, some some peace of mind, which is kind of important right now. Yeah, it's uh, this, this, I think, strategy of recognizing that, hey, we might be heading into a recession. We almost certainly are. And so cash is king. You need to get money up front. That means, you know, more of a focus on prepayment, more of a focus on annual subscription. I've seen kind of a trend of people doing this recently, even before COVID-19 sort of changed the world. Uh, A lot of people have come on the show and said, yeah, we're not even offering monthly plans anymore as a sort of fledgling company trying to build up cash flows. It's much more lucrative just to charge people for a year and get them in the door. You can just like spend way more to acquire customers that way because you're making way more per customer. You're not as worried from month to month. And now, like you said, it's extremely important because you're not even sure if a lot of these customers are going to be in business a year from now. So these month to month contracts like might be completely worthless. Um, how do you, if you're sort of already charging a certain way, go to customers and, and ask for these big prepayments? And how do you, you know, get them to say yes? Do you offer them a discount? Do you offer them a deal? Do you change things up? Or do you just kind of say, hey, look, things are changed. Uh, this is kind of, you know, our new ask. I think everything is on the table, right? I think that people are too afraid, too afraid of things. So in, in our case, um, in, in general, I think that people feel like whenever they want to change something about pricing or the way they do contracts or the way they charge, they feel like it's almost a, um, like we, we can't go to people that we have won a certain way as customers and now tell them things are changing. And it's like, but why? Who says that? Who says that you can't? Like, is your support team still the same? Is your service team still the same? Is your feature set still the same? Is any customer that buys from you never asking for more things or demanding any changes from you? There's no such concept where this is how we got into business last year. And so this is the only way we can be in business for the next 30 years. That that, that doesn't exist. I think especially less experienced founders and teams have a lot more anxiety around these. Like they see they need to change something, but what holds them back is the fear of confronting customers that might get upset. And I think that um, that, uh, you shouldn't. Some people will always get upset. The more... Some people will get upset, but if you respond calm, cool, and collected, they'll relax, right? It's funny how people are like, this is outrageous. And then you go, I get that you feel that way, but if you think about it, it really isn't. And then they go, yes, it isn't. (laughs) (laughs) What? Like one email ago, you're screaming at me, and now you're like totally agreeing with everything I said. Um, So in in our case, to be specific, like we um, just offered people a great deal, and we told them it's simple. You buy now, you get a great deal. You wait till the world is more sane and certain. You get, you know, the deal that the sane world gets, that everybody else gets, right? It's a kind of a, a riskier time to prepay, so you get a better deal. And a lot of people felt that that was appealing. Um, but we've also done other things. Like we, when we did the cost-cutting thing, there were certain customers that were doing things that were costing us a lot of money for a variety of reasons, right? That that we didn't care as much about it holistically. We're like, you know, amongst all customers, our margins are great. And if a few of them do things that eat into that margin, we, we, were, we just weren't paying attention to that. That was not that big of a deal. But as when we went through the every penny counts exercise of what if the world changes forever and we need to save every penny, we had to approach a couple of customers and go, hey, you know, you're doing all these funky things with our API or with all these other things that you've done. Like, 
you know, uh, and it costs us too much money and you need to change it, right? And it's not up for debate. And it's also not a question of if you like it or not, because none of them liked it. But it was like, we need to do this. This is the deal. We can't be, um, we cannot have a, a sustained partnership if our relationship isn't healthy right now. The way you're using our service, it's not healthy for us. So it needs to change. And I've had this before. I had to renegotiate once with a customer that had prepaid and signed a contract for three years. And uh, and then when we looked at kind of how we charged them back then, how the deal was closed, this was in the er very early days. We'd given them an insane discount and we're like losing money on them, right? And and so I had to renegotiate and tell them, you either have to pay 50% more, and this is, was a customer that was paying us hundreds of thousands a year. Either you have to pay 50% more or you have to go, right? And, and they screamed and they shouted, but I always came back to the, I get it, but for this relationship to work, for us to be able to serve you long term, we need to make money. We cannot lose yeah. money. We're losing money. So either you need to bring your money somewhere else or you need to give us enough so we can do a good job serving you. It's just that, that simple, no matter how upset you are. And uh, sooner or later, especially the ones that scream the loudest, they get on board. They just go with the program and go, okay, well, I guess they have a point. So yeah. if you need to change something about your contracts, how you want to charge, you can make it optional. Some companies might be in a situation where they, 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 they can't. They have to say, this is the only way we're going to do business now. And you have to take it or leave it. And that's always going to be harder. Like people are going to respond um, stronger to it. But if it's the right thing to do, if you think it's still fair, um, then you'll have to do it if you like it or not. And, and you don't have to be that afraid of it. It's just part of doing business and part of, part of life. What about running your company and, you know, the fact that you've already been remote, like I was saying earlier, like I, I imagine a lot of stuff is kind of the same, but there's some differences. For example, a lot of your employees probably are spending a lot more time working with their kids around than they were earlier. Uh, you've written a lot. You've, you've, you've talked a lot about running a remote company elsewhere online, but like what's changed with you trying to sort of, you know, motivate the troops and keep your company running? Yeah. First, I think it's important to recognize that working from home during a global pandemic with the, your entire family is not the same as working remotely, right? <laughs> they're related, but they're not the same thing. Um, and so for us, um, we had decided fairly early that we would want to move a number of our teams and people to a four-day work week, which is not what we usually do. We usually work for five days. There's still some people that are very customer facing and they didn't want to do the four day work week. Like, you know, our, people that are not at home with their four children and are having a hard time dealing with homeschooling a number of children, running a school from home and doing a bunch of other things that they didn't used to while they were working. So we, we made it optional, but um, a lot of people, we, we gave the option to go down to a four day work week because a lot of our team members were telling us that, um, it's become very stressful for them to work and they have so many more responsibilities at home, um, having to take care a lot more of the children, having to deal a lot more with family yeah. issues. And so we wanted to relieve people a little bit of pressure and give a bit more space for people to deal with it. Even if we didn't do, like even if we said it's still a five-day work week, just deal with it, people would just not work. We, we, we Like they just wouldn't, but they just would feel more stressed about it versus now they can not work and relax. So, so uh, hopefully be more sane, be better family members, but also be better employees for us. Um, so that was a, a big change that, that, that we made for us uh, to keep everybody sane. Um, and then we had to like do, we've in, definitely increased the amount of like, uh, usually a lot of the social interaction and fun interaction and games and all that for us would happen during the uh, team retreats. We would do every six months, we'd fly everybody into a city for a whole week and those weeks those retreats are our second best product like over seven years we've really built them to a science and it's not just like let's hang out and you know kumbaya and and, and get drunk or whatever and, and and work from the same room those weeks have become very important strategic tools of how we run the company and it was taken away our, our yeah. first retreat was supposed to be in april Right? And we had to cancel it in, in February, seeing that we didn't think we would be able to make it. So we had to start doing more of this, um, you know, having uh, game nights virtually, doing a lot more of that. And we changed the way we do meetings in the sense that every meeting that's happening now at close starts with a personal update. 
Uh, and so when we do meetings, people go, okay, since last week, you know, um, things are fine. I'm happy. And I started gardening. And so I feel a bit better. And then the next person would go, well, my mom is sick. I'm stressed the fuck out. I constantly on the phone with her. And I'm really worried and I can't focus. And everybody goes, oh, shit. And then the next person goes and says, well, we're moving right now. And we're having this and that trouble. And this is going on. Yeah. And, and that personal update, we didn't used to do that uh, in every meeting. And now we do. And we see, especially during these kind of times, it was incredibly important because we would have these moments where people would say things that made everybody go, holy shit, this is going on in your life. And it would, A, be just good for everybody to just air out what's going on and be able to communicate that. But it also helped us to understand how are people doing? What is going on in people's lives and be more supportive and be more understanding and have just more context um, and for many, it was also just like a relief to hear that everybody was struggling with the same stuff they were struggling with. And so yeah. it just made them feel a little bit better, a little bit more connected. Those are just some things that I can think of that that we had to like, change. Sounds adjust, like one of those, improve. those changes that might last. You know? Yeah. Like, wow, this is yeah. like nice to hear everyone's personal update. Maybe we should just keep doing this indefinitely. At Indie Hackers, we yeah. have a community manager and she's got five kids. And so you can wow. imagine what her life is like right now with five kids at home. <laughs> and yeah. she already does like a ton of work. So my brother and I have like kind of taken over a lot of the community management to sort of help her out, especially on days where she's just, you know, wants to spend time with her family. And that's also a habit where it's like, hey, we should just be doing this all the time. You know, even when all of this is over, we're just going to keep doing it the same way. And it's interesting to think about what's going to change. You know, the point that you made that remote working is very differently, very different than having to stay at home with your family. They're kind of related, but they're not necessarily the same. I think a lot of people are assuming that, oh, this is just going to completely change you know, everyone's getting a taste of remote work and everyone's going to see exactly what it's like. But it's not necessarily the case because this is, isn't exactly what it's normally like. And so a lot of people might not like it because it's completely different. Um, what do you think is going to stay the same at close? And, and also, you know, what do you think is going to change in the SaaS industry? And, and, you know, what do you think we're going to see on the other side of this? I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure yet. I at first, I was very cynical. Like, I, I did a lot of counter tweeting to the tweets of, like, this is the moment of remote work. Everybody is going to fucking. <laughs> I was like, dudes, and, you know, people, like, eh, the people that are forced to go home while screaming babies in the background, downloading a bunch of software they never used, trying to figure out how to do work in that environment, right. they're not going to be like, this is the future. This is how I want to live my life every day from now on. They might not. This is not a soft gentle introduction to this world right um but now i'm like well you know it's it, it, it was a it is a rough introduction but still i do think that ultimately it is accelerating i think there's going to be a, a pullback and lots of people are going to be like i could never work from home long term but i do think that a lot of companies are going to go well massive office spaces maybe we want to shy away from that giving people more options to work from home like Many companies will see that certain teams, just the same amount of work is getting done or the same work product. And they're like, ah, interesting. These people were able to responsibly work without us you know, having them confined in a specific space. So I do think that it's going to ultimately accelerate the adoption of technology in many areas of life. Uh, it already has. Zoom, that my mom knows what Zoom is, is blowing I know, my mind. Man. It's it crazy. is mind-blowing. I never would have thought that. Uh, my mom is as untech savvy as as you can be, <laughs> um, and so uh, so that I think that this has pushed even more technology, not less, um, and that probably is going to continue, just accelerating it a little bit. Not that that was not a trend before. Same thing with distributed and remote work. Um, the other thing that's interesting, I'm not sure if this is true or not. It really will last, but. I am wondering, I am hearing a lot of people's sentiment being uh, maybe living in a city is not as awesome. Maybe I want to live somewhere else um, and then work remotely, right? Uh, maybe right. if I could have great career opportunities, but live somewhere that's beautiful, that is nature, that's closer to my family, that's not as stressful and that's not as uh, vulnerable to these types of things. Maybe that is the future I want to be in. And so I see a lot of desire from people to move away from big cities. And that is not something I was seeing before, I personally. Um, uh, and so that's interesting. I, I wonder if that's going to last. I worry about travel. I love to travel. I'm slightly worried about the future yeah. of travel. 
in the next two, three years, how difficult Did you read um, Brian Chesky's letter? So Airbnb, Airbnb did a huge round of layoffs. Yeah. And he had like a, frankly, a heartbreaking letter to, you know, a huge part of the company. And a, a big part of it was kind of, you know, things have changed for now. And, you, you know, we're going to make it through it. But at the other end of this, we're not sure what travel and these sort of short term stays are going to look like. We just don't know. And so, yeah, I'm right there with you. Like travel is going to be different. Yeah, and I'm I'm not sure if it's gonna be in a better way. I, I'm afraid not. Um, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. Um, the other thing that like, yeah. So those are some of the things. But the thing I'm waiting for mostly right now is like over the next I think six to twelve months, I'm waiting for some. I'm expecting some dominoes to fall globally mm -hmm. that are gonna feel surprising uh, because they're not in the headlines right now. They're not something we're all thinking about, but they have been affected by this in ways that will be impactful. And then like it, it's nobody talks about it, nobody talks about it. And then all of a sudden it's a big deal and it's impacting us. And I wonder what that's going to look like. Um, I also feel like we have just entered the stage of this pandemic where it's not like, I think we all think as humans in like storylines from movies, like it's, there's a beginning, a middle and an end. And I feel like February, March was the beginning for most people and the way they felt about things. And then yeah. April, May now feels like the middle. And so people are thinking about the end. Like, it's just one more act and we're out of this. And, and, and I wonder if it's going to be like multiple movies, one after the other, if this is going to be a trilogy or like a five-part series. And so uh, we're not going to just get out of this in the next, whatever, three, six months. And then it's behind us as like a distant memory and so it's going to be very interesting times, I think, for a good amount of time ahead. Yeah, maybe it'll be like the Lord of the Rings where there's like eight endings, just ending scene after another ending scene, and it never quite ends. <laughs> uh, hey, but at least at least it had a happy ending. I mean, happy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> relatively well, hope, speaking. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a happy ending this time too. Anyway, yeah. Steli, it was great uh, catching up to you, catching up with you and hearing what's going on in your life and how you're navigating all this stuff at close and also just getting a snapshot of what it's like to be the founder of a uh, maturing company. Um, a lot of a lot of indie hackers are listening to this. They've been trying to start fledgling businesses, and now they've been like hit with this sort of existential crisis. Okay, well now it's real. You know, now uh, I might not be able to get a job if this doesn't work out, or I might not be able to quit my job if I don't grow my company. What's your advice uh, for people in that situation? Do you think they should be thinking differently about being indie hackers? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think so. It's always tough to give advice very generically speaking because these yeah. e even indie hackers, they live in different parts in the world, live very different lives with very different responsibilities and challenges. But in general, I I think, you know, um, you know, I, I think that this is this is a better time than ever before, probably, or in recent history, to start something versus to look for a stable career. Right? I mean, let's be honest, I I, I feel like Trying to look for a company that has stability over the next five years and can give me a secure job that's not going to change or not going to be in jeopardy is harder now than it seemed in 2019, 2018, 2017. And so um, doing something entrepreneurial seems seems smart to me right now um, and investing in that. And then I'll just say that one theme that we've been repeating in the company, I think it might be also useful I really am a quote machine today, but uh, another another quote that I've been repeating a lot is, uh, it's not the strongest that survive, it's the most adaptable that do. And so I do think there's beauty in being an indie hacker. Like it, small, so, everything that you have always seems to suck, right? If you're like, if you, we were joking about this, you run a community and, and, and you're like, ah, I wish I'd run a SaaS company. I run a SaaS company. I'm like, I wish I'd just run a podcast and community. Life would be so much easier. Like whatever we have, we kind of devalue. But being, and being small feels that way. It's like, ah, oh, I'm in such a disadvantage against anybody that, out there. But it's not true. There's beauty in that. And, and being an indie hacker right now gives you such nimbleness. You can be so adaptable. You can change your mind in a second and change what you do. The numbers you need to drive are not that big to be meaningful and, and significant. And um, you can take risks maybe now that you didn't feel comfortable before because the opportunity cost was too high. 
But now, what is the thing that you're really losing out on? Where are all these companies that are offering amazing salaries and, and like a 10-year contract where you're never going to have to worry? They're not out there right now. So might as well invest in you, take some risk on you, um, and build something for yourself. Um, so, so I think this is an amazing time to be an indie hacker. And being small means you travel with less baggage, you have less responsibility, you have less commitments. So you can move faster and you have to... Just accomplish very little to start doing meaningful things and have meaningful impact in your life. So um, I'm excited for all indie hackers out there. Um, there's a romantic side of me that's like, be nice to be an indie hacker right now. You just like <laughs> be adventurous. So uh, I think it's a good time to to be that, and people should feel excited and confident about their position in the world right now if they're an indie hacker. I think that advice is spot on and it's it's happening. There's more indie hackers right now than I've ever seen on the website. The numbers are just going up and to the right. People are realizing that there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of change. It's a good time to start a business. And I think indie hackers tend to be just kind of an ambitious sort of opportunistic crowd where they look on the bright side and they just like are optimistic. They see crisis and they see how they can change their lives for the better as a result of it. So uh, indie hackers take Sally's message to heart. Realize you can be more nimble. You have all sorts of advantages that other companies don't have. If you want to change your mind on something, you don't have to write a sad letter and fire 3,000 people. And <laughs> it's a great place to be in. Steli, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Can you let listeners know where they can go to learn more about uh, Close and what you're up to? Yes. Um, so you can go to close.com and visit our blog um, to check that out. Uh, you can send me an email, steli at close.com. If you want to get, so we, we put together a few resources for people that are trying to sell and acquire customers during this crisis, uh, email templates of good emails and bad emails and strategies to get your first couple of customers during this time. If that's uh, of interest, you can just send me an email, steli at close.com, say Indie Hacker book or crisis toolkit, and I'll, I'll know what you need. and I'll send it to you. Um, and then if you're into podcasts, um, as you mentioned, uh, Heat and Shah, the, uh, the, the living legend and, and I, we have a podcast together called The Startup Chat. You can go check that out at thestartupchat.com. Um, yeah, if I can ever help anybody from the indie hacker community over the last couple of years, people have always stayed in touch with me and reached out and asked questions. I, I love the, the community that you've built. Uh, always feel free to reach out and ask for help. I, I'll do my best. And I want to second the recommendation for uh, the Startup Chat. Cool podcast. And the fact that Heaton is so focused on marketing and your sales, it's like the two of you have the base is covered. And you always figure out like some new interesting topic to talk about. I don't know how you guys keep coming up with so many things to talk about, but the episodes are short and sweet. I think if you listen to this podcast and you enjoy it, you're really going to like the startup chat. Thanks again, Sally, for coming on. Hey, thank you so much.